Well, just a uh, uh, real thanks to this worship team, especially then that song, which everybody was clapping on as well, With My Soul. Wasn't that wonderful uh, to hear this morning? We're so also just really thankful for Kaylin, for you letting us use the talents of Kaylin Austin once again. So we're here this morning, and it's just great to be in the house again with everybody. And as you know, uh, we've been in and out of the house. We've been out side and back in. Last week, I had the great privilege of speaking at Kingdom Embassy, and you had the great uh, joy and privilege of hearing Arthur Duran. And Arthur and I and Justin and the pastoral staff and Luke were all creating collaborative things between us and Kingdom Embassy, and we're looking forward to what all that might mean for us. I'm also just uh, thankful for the art team. And isn't this awesome back here? This is just a wonderful thing that they did on the, the backdrop there. As Luke says, every time they have an idea, it's a really great idea. And I've actually never been in a church with so much art just flowing out of the people. I've been in churches with art, but never this much art. So it's always wonderful uh, to see that week in and week out. Now, one thing that I I just want to draw to your attention is that we started our kids' ministry again this week. And so just a special uh, act of gratitude is in store for Elena and for all the people down at at kids' ministry. And even though they can't hear us, let's give them a round of applause, too. And uh, since we are not able to do our usual trunk or treat because of COVID, we are excited to offer a new kind of trunk or treat this year. We'll be partnering with three local churches, Kingdom Embassy, Calvary Church, and Trinity Lutheran to offer a drive through trunk or treat. And this will take place in the Sears parking lot of the Lakes Mall on Saturday, October 30, 31st from 2 to 3 p.m. So we will have the amazing opportunity to show God's love to our community and offer prayer and connection with each car. We already have a large number of people from the community who are planning to attend. So this is what we need. So we need quite a few volunteers to decorate car trunks, line the parking lot, and hand out candy to the kids as the cars drive through. The kids will hold their bags out the car window so it will be contact-free. You can sign up on a Google Doc found on the church website homepage, Friday email, and church Facebook page. We also need candy donations, of course, and uh, one of the great things about candy donations at a church is there's, there's always some leftover for the staff to eat later, so I'm just an just, uh, you know, inside scoop. Uh, there's a bin for candy by the front door, so talk to Elena. Well, I'm also uh, very thankful for you for staying safe and coming here. Uh, We want to continue to encourage you to stay safe, to wear your masks. And as we have these services, we're trying to keep them just a little bit shorter. We really appreciate you being able to come in and then just exit right out the building. If you have time to stick around and talk with people outside the building, that's also awesome. Well, let's pray as we come to God's Word. We thank you, our Father for your presence this morning. We ask that you would guide us as we seek to understand your heart in the matter of justice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in a series called Discipleship Essentials, and during this time, we're learning the essentials of discipleship. Many of you have used the book Discipleship Essentials. I've been leading a small group on Wednesday nights, and it's really awesome to both do the personal preparation, to come here on a Sunday morning, and then to talk in a small group about things like we have in the past few weeks. Grace, the, uh, f- being filled with the Spirit, and last week, the fruit of the Spirit. And today we're going to talk about justice, which is a predominant theme throughout the Scriptures. So I just want to say a beginning thing about justice Justice is the idea of God setting things right. And so God is very, very concerned for things being set right within this world. So as you look through the scriptures, one of the things you find is that God's concern for justice, for wrongs to be righted, is all throughout the scriptures. So here's just a a couple of passages. Isaiah 11, 1 and verse 4, and this is a Christmas passage, you know, the stump of Jesse will rise up, and then it says about this person, this king, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. The word righteousness, which is to make things right, or to do right things, and justice are oftentimes used as sort of synonyms for each other. So you'll see righteousness and justice kind of going hand in hand. Psalm 97, 1. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. 
Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Here's another one that many of you probably have memorized, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And so as we, we think about passages in the Old Testament, you'll see God being talked about as a just God, the God who reigns on the throne. And then as you get into the New Testament, these sorts of ideas are, are transformed. So you notice I said righteousness and justice are used uh, in, in the same way. When Paul uses the word righteousness, one of the things that he's saying about righteousness is that all of us are unrighteous before God. And the only way that that can be made right is by Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. There has to be a just punishment for all of our sins. And so when we, by grace through faith, accept that Jesus died on our behalf, we are viewed as righteous. Not that we are. The righteous is, righteousness is imputed to us. So God sees us as righteous people. And as we live into this truth, he calls us more and more to act justly and to live according to God's laws and commands. At the e end of a long list of the ways that Jesus wants us to be righteous, that is, our willingness to do the right thing before God in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 48. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the word perfect in Matthew 5, 48 speaks to the response of the whole heart a total or thorough commitment to God's will. Here's what uh, my seminary professor, Scott McKnight, said about this. For Jesus, the pursuit of righteousness is obeying God's will in all its aspects, personal, social, and communal, and is to be the first priority of his followers. Jesus goes on in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we're to be righteous people. Not just people that are viewed as being righteous because of the death of Jesus on the cross on our behalf, but to live out that righteousness that's been given to us. This justice, primarily but not solely, is directed throughout the scripture to the poor and broken, and it reflects God's heart. His concern for those who are in need, and this is our discipleship focus today. To become people of justice. To see the needs in the world and to seek to meet those needs with our lives. And so I'm going to talk about two ways. Feed and clothe Jesus from Matthew 25, 37 through 46. So the first point, love Justice, do mercy. In the Evangelical Covenant Church, we actually divide up our emphases in the world along six different ways. And one of the, the cabinets is called Love, Justice, Do Mercy. And it's really important for us to think about this within the world. And the specifics of loving justice and doing mercy is you're supposed to do this, do this thing. So in your discipleship essentials, one of the things that we go through every week is a core truth. Let me just read you the core truth from this justice passage. First starts with a question. How is sacrificial love expressed among those broken by the world? The answer, when love intersects broken lives, Christ's disciples are called to stand for justice. Biblical justice means lifting the bonds of oppression, identifying with the cause of the poor, and meeting the needs of the downtrodden. And that's a very powerful way of talking about justice. And so Isaiah 58, 6 through 7, brings up this theme. Now, the people of Israel were taken into exile, by and large, because they didn't obey God's covenant. They didn't keep his law. One of the primary things that God wants in his law is a sense of justice, of doing right and not doing wrong. And so the people had gone apart from that, and they had started to do all sorts of things. Even their religious uh, celebrations were warped according to what they wanted to do. So that fasting, for instance, became something that they only did for themselves. It was sort of a magical rite 
That is, you fasted in order to grab and get things from God. Whereas biblical fasting is actually an expression that comes from within and outwards. Scott McKnight talks about this in his book, Fasting, Ancient Practice. And he's saying, as we all know, when you're not feeling good about something, when you feel sad, what do you not want to do? You don't want to eat. You lose your appetite. And so fasting is an expression of the whole person expressing back to God the sense that not, something is not right in this world. And so Isaiah comes to this passage and he sees people trying to manipulate God into doing what they want him to do. And he says in Isaiah 58, 6 to begin, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Then it goes on in verse 7 and says, Is it not to share your food with the hungry? And to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. When I, when I first read this, I, I thought, this is kind of weird. Because you would think that Isaiah would start talking about fasting. But what he's saying is, I don't care about your religious festivals. I want you to do what is right. I want you to loose the chains of injustice. I want you to untie the cords of the yoke and break every yoke. I want you to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter and to clothe them. We see that God's concern here for those who are weaker to loose these bonds, to feed, to clothe, to provide. And this specificity, and this very specific things that we're supposed to do is true not only here in this passage, but almost all throughout the scriptures. So you get to passages like Amos. I mean, I just was like, yesterday I'm like, well, I know justice is throughout the Bible, so I'm just going to open Amos. And I was like, I think there's some things in there about justice. I, Amos 2, 6 through 7. For three sins of Israel, even the four I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Amos 5.24, perhaps one of the most famous sayings in the scriptures. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. James 2, going into the New Testament. James 2, 15 through 17. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is what? Dead. All throughout the scriptures. I mean, you could just like open it up and just put your finger down and you would find that God is very, very concerned for the oppressed and the poor and those who are going without. And so God's people are in the same way to be specifically valuing of others because God values others. Let me just say that in a different way. God wants us to specifically value others the way he values others. God's nature, one commentator said, is to give himself away to those who can never repay him. That's what grace is. See, followers of Jesus Christ have received salvation by grace through faith. We don't have salvation because we did anything. We have salvation because God gave it to us. And so when we're in the world and we see people and they don't have things, things that maybe you think they should have, maybe they didn't do the right things in your mind, it's still incumbent upon us to meet their needs, to see them, to value them. I know this isn't always easy. I mean, I've had my fair share of times where I've looked at somebody who didn't have something and I've thought thoughts in my head that were not helpful for helping them. So the application of loving uh, mercy and doing justice is this. To loose, to untie, to set free, to break every yoke, to share food, to provide for the poor, to clothe, to embrace others, to love mercy and do justice. You know, one of the things I love about this church is its ongoing commitment to those without and I've seen that in every church I've been in. 
You know, the church that we were involved in, Ann Arbor, people got involved with World Vision. And we decided together that we would raise up a vocational center in Rwanda. And so people gave money for that. And then I went on a vision trip to Rwanda, and there was this building that had been built. And there was a plaque on it. It was just, it was wild. On the plaque, it had the name of our church. And we had a big celebration with dancing and rejoicing. There was about 1,000 people there. And we'd, we'd given some money out of our abundance. Out of our abundance, we gave money to them. And it trained people in all sorts of trades and tasks. Later that day, I went with a group of people. And we were given a bag of food because we sponsor children. Just an aside, good thing to sponsor kids. It's like $35 a month for a thing like World Vision. And you know, when they, when they do that, what they do is they create a community of people. And they'll have anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people in that community. And $35 a month comes into that community. And they decide how to give that money out to people. One of the key ways they do it is through food. And so they, they pack this like... See this. And what was really kind of amazing to me is just walking up to their house. It wasn't easy at all to walk to where they lived. And I just thought uh, to myself, you know, this small thing is really worthwhile. And, you know, I know people all throughout every church I've ever been in have done things like that because those are the specific things that we're called to do. Visiting people in prison, helping people who don't have a home have a home. And here's the thing about that. That's a part of our discipleship. We are supposed to do that. And if there's something inside of you right now that wants to go out and help somebody, that is the Spirit of God convicting you and telling you that it is your turn and your time to help people. Here's the second point. We need to feed and clothe Jesus. Feed and clothe Jesus. The idea about this is to make the helping of people very personal. And the reason that we do that, we want to do that, is because Jesus tells us to do that. Matthew 25. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, and this is at the end of time. People are coming before God to be judged. They will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And Jesus will reply, the king, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's a hair-raising passage. There's some people in every church who are like, you're going to preach the hair-raising passages? And you know, whenever I hear them say that, I'm not always clear why they want to hear those passages. Because here it is. When you look at this, one of the things you have to understand is who are the least of these and who are the people not feeding them? And there's a little bit of a division among scholars, but I kind of side with the scholars who say that the least of these are those people who are going out in the garb of the poor, identifying with them and spreading the news of Jesus Christ. That is, early missionaries. These are the least of these. And so when people receive them, everything depends on whether they're going to receive these people and receive the gospel and treat them like Jesus. Because then they'll get to meet Jesus themselves. But here's the interesting thing about that, though I think that that's also true. It's interesting to me that early missionaries so identified themselves with the poor 
that they went without clothes, that they were hungry and thirsty, that they were sick and ailing, and they were in prison. And you know, Paul was an example of somebody who was put in prison. And these people so identified themselves with the poor that Jesus himself says, they're like me. Why? Because Jesus identified himself with the poor. Why do you think people loved Jesus so much as he walked around Galilee in Judea? Is it because he was going to tell them a health and wealth gospel? That if they believed in him, he was going to give them riches? No. It's because he loved them and cared for them and wanted the best for them and healed them and gave them a taste of what the kingdom of God is like in which every wrong is made right and God is exalted. I'm going to say that one more time, and I want everybody to say amen. In which every wrong is righted, and the king is exalted. Amen. amen. It's um, an overwhelming thought. And it is our thought that we have, that we need to live into this. And here's one of the things that I will say, you know, as you go through Isaiah, go through that passage that we just talked about, Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 7. Verse 8 then says this, and he takes up a theme of the blessing that comes to people when they care for people who are in need. I want you to listen. It's like an A, B, A. B is where you, you attend to the needy. Here's A. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. Light dawning, healing, prayers answered, the Lord protecting, the Lord guiding, satisfying your needs and strengthening you. The things that all of us want. And how do we access them? By seeing everybody else who does not have those things and seeking to reach them for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. We give you thanks, our Father, for your presence this morning. Guide and direct us to be your people. To be your holy people. To be your righteous people, your just people, your people seeking justice for those who have not, who are oppressed, who are treated differently because the color of their skin. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us as your people to do your will in this regard. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.